There are certain patterns that people do who succeed and certain patterns that people do who are frustrated or overwhelmed. And I want to share with you what those patterns are because this is not about just giving you some little time planner because that's not going to change your life, nor, nor will a piece of software. What will change your life is learning how to control and direct your own mind and emotions and doing it in a way that really gives you what you want versus what maybe your environment may be demanding from you right now. I hope that sounds like a journey that's enticing to you because if it is, I think that the skills you're going to get here will give you a lot more than what you expected when you signed up for this course. Now, by the way, you signed up for a program here called More Time, and yet you know there isn't any more. So why would you sign up for a course like that? Well, probably because inside of you, you know that there's more time for what matters for you if you restructured your life a little bit. You may not know how to do that, but a part of you knows that that's really possible or you wouldn't even take in a program like this. In fact, I got a really important question for you. And that is, what is time? I mean, think about it. What is it? What would you say if somebody said, what is time? Well, people have all kinds of interesting answers that day. Oh, it's a calendar. It's, it's, it's a measure of activity, some people say. But I would say to you that time is nothing but emotion. Time is a feeling. And we forget that. And that's why we get stressed. Because we don't think about our feelings. We create to-do lists. And we focus on activities. And very often, we get all of our to-do lists done. We cross off all the activities, but we're still not fulfilled. And many times, we've got a bunch of movement, but we really don't have any achievement, much less these good feelings that we're pursuing. I mean, think about it. Time, you've had experiences in your life where time flew, right? Where hours may have felt like minutes, especially if you're with somebody you love or you're doing something that really juiced you as a person, something you're really passionate about. So you and I got to get clear that if we're going to have more time, what we really have to have is more of the emotions we deserve, that we're going to have to learn how to direct and shape our own lives in a new way. And by the way, the promise that's been given to us throughout the years was that technology was going to give us more time, right? How's that work for you so far? I don't know about you, but I found that as my life became somewhat more successful, it actually became much more stressful. And with technology, instead of that freeing me, on some ways, and it's my own fault, that technology almost became the master of my life. I found myself limiting and living a life that felt limited by all these reactions I was having. And what I mean by that is work no longer was a, something I did at the office. Work was something that followed me on my belt with my beeper. It showed up in emails wherever I was in the world. And it showed up on my cellular telephone. And I was constantly reacting and then wondering why, gosh, I have all this activity and I have no time. And gosh, I'm not really feeling very happy even though I'm doing some good things. The reason is because there is one thing, and it's not technology, that'll change your life. And you know what's great about this one thing is it's one of the most powerful forces in your life. And the good news is this force, this power is something you've been using your whole life. And that is the power of focus. Just by changing what we focus on, we change literally what we feel. What you focus on to a great extent determines whether you're succeeding or whether you're failing in your business, in your career, with your children, in your intimate relationships as well. So focus really determines the quality of our lives. Whether or not you're fulfilled or whether or not you just feel stressed is really a matter of focus. And ultimately, your achievement level is clearly directed on where do you focus? Where do you put your energy, your emotion, your time? But the challenge is that most of us don't direct it consciously. In fact, a lot of us are incredibly stressed because we don't consciously direct our focus. Extraordinary people who produce extraordinary results have a different way of thinking. OPA is a different way of thinking. It models what it is I've learned from being around several million people, some famous, some not so famous, but maybe more profound in what they've done for the world and for themselves. I think, wow, in business and in life, the way you focus your mind will determine your success or failure. Now, here's the challenge. Most of us don't direct our focus because we're in reaction to environmental stimulus. What that means, in technical terms, made simple, is there's three things in our life that tends to grab our focus and make us react rather than really live our life on our own terms. What first gets your focus? Things that have the potential to give you pain. Things that you kind of worry about. Things that you are challenged by. Things that you think could be a real problem. That tends to get our focus, and we tend to call that worry. Worry is an achiever word for fear. We're fearful that something bad's going to happen, so we put a lot of attention into it. And sometimes it's at the expense of things that are much more important, like our family or our health. Sometimes we worry about things that will never happen. And I think that what happens for most of us is fear gets our focus. And it's natural. It's our survival instinct to avoid pain. 
But we've got to break out of it if we want an extraordinary quality of life and think differently. And I'm going to show you some ways that you can do that for yourself. The second thing that tends to get our focus is things that can give us pleasure, especially immediate pleasure. Why? Well, think about it. We're stressed a lot of the time. We want to get out of that stress, so we look for something to make ourselves feel good, because that'll happen real quick. And very often we pick things that make us feel good for the moment, but don't really make our life better long term. Very often what you'll do to feel good is go clean off your desk, right? I used to do this all the time. I got all these projects to do. I don't know where to start. I'm overwhelmed. Oh, my desk is messed up. Let me just arrange everything here. Because you know what? I can complete all that and feel really good about myself. Because truthfully, self-esteem, and I hate that term because it's so overused, but a person's sense of identity, our sense of certainty about our lives, our sense of worth, is tied directly to our feeling that we control events, not events control us. When we feel like events are controlling us, our self-esteem drops, our level of stress increases. So what a lot of us do is try and get control of it by doing little things or by doing something we're really good at. You know, let's say you spend a lot of time in your work and you don't spend much time with your kids because at work you feel like you're in control and gosh, kids are a challenging thing. They're so different, they're so unique. You think you get all handled and they surprise you with something new, right? So very often we try to focus on those things we feel good about Sometimes it's the expense of the overall value of our life, and again, we're reacting still. The third area that tends to get our focus, if we don't put the stakes in the ground up front and say, here's what I'm going to focus on, here's what I want for my life, is sure enough, we get, tend to get caught up in other people's demands. And then our life becomes about responding to other people's urgencies and reacting. You might say, but Tony, you know, my supervisor is going to do that, or my boss is going to do that. Yes, but I think you're going to find when you learn this OPA system, you're going to be able to get your boss to get results they never had before. You're going to be able to do more for them than they've ever seen before. And you'll be able to literally help them to manage you and themselves more effectively if you have a supervisor. If you're in charge, quote unquote, then I think you're going to find that there's going to be a great deal of fulfillment and you won't be responding to everybody's demands there either. Does that sound like it might be useful? I can tell you something, as long as you're responding to the things that concern you, the potential for pain or worry, as long as you're trying to get a quick fix of feeling good, as long as you're responding to people's demands, you're living a life of reaction and you won't get the level of fulfillment, much less the results that you really deserve. So how do we turn that around? Well, first of all, you got to understand the price of focusing on what you fear. And I'll give you a fun, simple example. Years ago, I, had, I took up a fun sport, which is auto racing. And when I first went to this racing school, the very first time you get there, here's what they do with you. They put you in a car and they say, we're going to show you what an automobile is capable of and what you can do. So you get next to this race car driver and they take you through this course and they're going 140 miles an hour straight at a wall and a corkscrew turn and your heart's beating out of you and they do it. And by the end of this thing, they look at you and say, you know, in four days you're going to be able to do this. And you think to yourself, you're joking. <laughs> There's just no way this is going to happen. But they say, let me tell you the secret. The reason you're scared right now is you don't know what you do if you got out of control. You don't know what you do if you got caught up in a spin. And I said, so before you ever learn to drive, the most important skill that you got to develop is learning how to come out of a spin quickly. And when the man was telling me this, I thought, God, what a great metaphor for life. Because we all do really well when things are going well. It's when we go into a spin, when things aren't working out well, when things that are stressful happen that we kind of get lose control of the direction of our lives and start reacting and pretty soon our fear tends to cause us to end up on the rocks or in the wall, so to speak. So I said, okay, well, what's the secret? He said, it's really simple, Tony. Here's how it works. Here's how you come out of a spin. Focus on where you want to go, like this left-hand turn we're going to need to make. Don't focus on the wall in front of you. If you focus on what you fear, the wall, guess what happens? The minute you focus on it, you steer in the direction of what you focus on and your life or your car moves that direction. If you focus on what you want, you will automatically steer everything in the direction of what you want. He said, do you ever hear about you know, somebody driving down like a, a desert highway and there's like a telephone pole every quarter of a mile and this guy's driving his Porsche 100 miles an hour and it's the, the telephone pole? And I said, yeah, he goes, that happens all the time. He said, you know why? As soon as people start to feel like they're out of control, they focus on what they're afraid of hitting and they drive right into it. I thought, that's a great metaphor for life. He said, so all you got to do is don't get scared. Even if you do get scared, you will. Even though you're fearful, focus on what you want, not what you fear. I said, no problem. I teach this stuff. <laughs> How do you think I did? Not very good. <laughs> because what happened was he was smart. He got me driving for a while, and I was concentrating, and I was waiting. I knew any moment he's going to do this. But see, life doesn't give things to you. It doesn't give you challenges when you're ready for them. 
It's like just when everything's going great, that's when life comes by and gives you a little test. That's like when our creator says, it's time for you to grow and you're not ready for it, so you're going to grow the most right now. And so sure enough, I'm driving for 10 or 15 minutes. I'm waiting for us to push the button. After a while, I kind of just get caught up in the rhythm stuff, you know, kind of like getting caught up in your life. And all of a sudden, he pushes the button. We start spinning out of control. What do you think the first place my brain goes? Wham, right at the wall. I'm driving right into it. He is smart, though. He wants to save our lives. He grabs my head and forces me to look in the direction we need to turn. And I'm fighting him because I want to see myself die. Right? Fortunately, he keeps holding my head. Now, as I turn and focus on where I want to go, without realizing what do I instantly do, I turn in the direction of what I want. I got a question for you, though. Do you think the minute you turn and you do the right thing, because now I'm doing the right thing, I'm turning the right direction, do you immediately get rewarded for that? See, we have a thing called momentum that's still going on. We're in what we call lag time right now, where we're doing the right things, but we're not getting the reward because of the old momentum. It's kind of like you ate like heck for 30 years, and now you've eaten well for two days. And you go, gosh, I'm not getting the result yet. Keep focusing, keep eating the right way, and it'll turn. But you got to keep the faith. You can't look back at the wall because that's what you want to do. You want to look back and go, it's not working. I want to see the failure. I want to see the crash. Fortunately, keeps holding my head. And what happens? Sure enough, we turn. And a few seconds later, the wheels catch and we turn and we miss the wall by about two or three feet. My heart is beating out of me. He goes, did you learn? I said, I learned. Did I learn? No. Took three or four more times of doing this of him forcing my head before I finally got it down. I got a very important question for you, though. If you focus on where you want to go, are you guaranteed not to have problems, guaranteed not to hit the wall? The answer is no, you could still hit the wall. But let me ask you an alternative question. If you focus on what you fear, if you focus on the problem, if you focus on the challenge ahead of you, and you drive yourself into that, are you going to crash? The answer is 100% yes. So there's no guarantee in life, but if we focus on what we want, our outcome, which is what OPA stands for, the first O in OPA, is outcome. What do I really want? If we focus on that, our chances increase geometrically. If we focus on our fear, we got a real problem. So the obvious question becomes, okay, well then how do I control my focus, Tony? Do I just think positive? Well, let me give you a clue. I don't believe in positive thinking. I don't believe you should go to your garden and say, there's no weeds, there's no weeds, there's no weeds, and do a bunch of affirmations. I got news for you, the weeds will take your garden. I believe in something really simple. I believe in seeing life as it really is, but not worse than it is. See, most people say, well, I'm just a skeptical person. I'm just a pessimistic person. What they're really saying is I'm fearful. I don't want to get my hopes up. I don't want to be disappointed again. But I'm here to tell you in life, you got to see it as it is and not worse than it is. You can't try and protect yourself or you protect yourself from success. You protect yourself from joy. you got to get your hopes up to make life work. So see it as it is, but not worse than it is. Second, you have to see it better than it is. Otherwise, there's no drive to make things better. you got to get a vision for what you want. What's the outcome? What's the vision for your life? Otherwise, you'll get caught up in the to-dos of daily living and you'll say, gosh, you know, I don't know what it is, but I, I feel like my life's about making a living instead of really experiencing life. So if you get a view of what your outcome is, of what you really want, wow, the game changes for you. And then once you know how it is and then you have a vision for how you want it to be, then the obvious third step to succeeding is you gotta make it the way you want it. And what we're gonna show you with open planning is how to do that. Now from a practical perspective, how do you actually change your focus in a second? Well, the way you and I do it is by asking questions. You see, when we say we're thinking, what we're really doing is asking and answering questions in our mind on a consistent basis. That's all thinking is. Thinking is the process of asking and answering questions. And if you ask a lousy question, what are you going to get? A lousy answer. So if your question is, how come I can never lose weight, your brain gives you an answer. Because you're a pig. <laughs> or if you say, how come I can never pull this off? Your brain says, ah, oh, because you're a schmuck, because you're, you're not ready, because you came from a dysfunctional family, or whatever lousy answer comes to a lousy question. What would be a better question around this idea of losing weight? Well, you could say, well, instead of how come I can't lose weight, you could say, how could I lose weight? Challenge with that question, it's a little better, but you'll probably say, I go on a diet. And diets are painful, so you probably don't want to do that. What would be a better question? How about, how could I lose weight and really enjoy the process? That's a different outcome, a different result than just losing weight. It's losing it and enjoying it. Now, if you ask, how can I lose weight and enjoy the process, your brain will give you a different answer because you're asking a better question. 
Now it might say, you know what? I've always wanted to learn to horseback ride or play polo or whatever it is you love to do. Now maybe I'll go do that. Or I love to play basketball. What if I can play basketball? I'm not even thinking about losing weight. It'll happen automatically. If you want a better answer for your life, you got to ask better questions. If you want a better plan, then you better ask better questions. And by the way, this is true of some of the most riveting aspects of our life because all human beings' lives are driven by the questions they ask. Some people succeed in life and they ask the question, you know, what's wrong with me? And they wonder why they feel depressed all the time. Or why can't I figure things out? We have to be very careful about the questions we ask ourselves. Does this make sense? I hope it does. Whether it's a Martin Luther King asking a question about his dream and how we can have equality, or whether it's a fun quote or a powerful quote, or whether it's a question of a leader like Robert Kennedy, but we know the famous quote said, some people see things that were done and they ask why. I look at things that were never done and ask why not. If you want to change your life, you got to change your questions. And if you want to change the experience of planning, you got to stop asking that silly question that everybody asks when they're going to plan something. I used to do this all the time. What is the question we all ask when we're going to plan something? What do I need to do? That is the wrong question. So why is that a lousy question? Why do we not want to start out when we're trying to plan our day or a week or a month or our life by saying, what do I need to do? Because you don't know the answer of what you need to do until you decide what it is you want. What is it you're looking for in your life? I mean, if you think about it, we've seen all these new time management systems come out, and I've used them all, and they all added some value to my life. But none of them really helped me to, to achieve at the level I now achieve, and they certainly didn't help me to really be fulfilled. They were about making up my to-do list of all the things I needed to do, and I found myself at the end of the day, even when I crossed everything off, very often still not feeling fulfilled. Because a lot of times I got everything done, but I didn't really achieve anything, and I've learned in my life not to mistake movement for achievement. See. 100 years ago, 200 years ago, maybe it was okay to make a to-do list because life wasn't that complex. The thing today is you're the mom, you're the dad, you're the husband, you're the wife, you're the lover, you're the community activist, you're the top peak performance athlete, you're the marketing manager for the company, you're part of the, the coach of the Little League team, and what you need to do depends on are you being a mom right now, or are you being a business person, are you being a lover, or are you being a best friend, are you being a daughter, who are you being? So, and we can't just try and manage all these roles also of our lives and expect we're going to have a life that's fulfilling when there's so much going on. We need a simple system that will help us before we try to design a plan for our time to really design a plan for our life. And that's what you're going to do starting today. And it's not perfect and it isn't something that's rigid. It gives you all kinds of flexibility. But it allows you to decide, hey, these are the areas of my life I'm really going to focus on. I'm going to make sure I put a certain amount of my time and focus right here in my family, right here in my physical body so I have the energy I want, right here in my emotional well-being, right here as being a marketing manager, right here in my business and empowering the people that I work with so that we have a great environment, that we don't just get results but we have fun. So we're going to show you a system for how to do that. And once you have the plan for your life, then your planning will not start with that silly question of what do I need to do, that's a lousy question. You're going to ask a different question. You're going to ask three of them and in a very specific order. And I'll just tell you up front, it's really simple. The OPA word stands for the three questions. Before I tell you the three questions, let me tell you what anyone who succeeds knows. You find anyone who's successful in any area of your life, business, finance, emotion, they're happy, they're fulfilled. Here's what they know. Number one, they know what they really want. Most people don't know what they really want. They don't know what we call their outcome, their result. And when you don't know what your outcome is, when you don't know what you really want, life can be really frustrating. Life becomes a bunch of things you have to do and it doesn't give you any juice. You don't have a clear direction for your life. And without a clear direction, very often you end up on the rocks of life. It just, you just don't have the guidance. You don't have that sense of that my life has some kind of meaning. The second thing that people succeed know is not only what they want, but why they want it. Because the reasons are what drive us as human beings. That sense of purpose, that's where the emotion is. That's where the juice is. Not just getting a target, but knowing why we want that target. That's what will get you to have the energy to actually follow through. And then the third question they know is, what do I need to do to make that happen? And people that know what they really want and know why they want it can usually figure out how to make it happen because they got enough drive and enough clarity about what they want. So OPA stands for those three questions in a very specific way. Let me tell you what OPA gives you. Freedom. Because what happens in life is most of us think our to-do list has to get done. Many times you don't have to do your whole to-do list. Most of us know that 20% of what you do gives you 80% of your results in life, doesn't it? 
And so what we're going to show you how to do is to have more flexibility, have a lot more choices, and get more results with more fulfillment by taking you through these three questions. And I want to point something out. OPA is not a time planner. Again, it isn't a book. If you open this book, you go, oh, it's got a calendar, and it's got an A through Z, and so do all these other programs. Or here's a nice piece of software. That's not OPA. OPA is a simple system of thinking that will change your focus, which will immediately change how you feel. It'll change the direction you're heading. It'll turn you in a different direction, and it'll get you a different set of results. Not only is it a simple system of thinking that changes direction and results, but it'll also make you feel fulfilled. Because think of it. The only difference between work and play is your purpose. A lot of people, when they're playing, do things that are really actually hard work. But they don't call it hard work because they say it's fun, because they decided, I want to do this. This is a cool thing. This is competitive, or this is creative, or this is strong. And everyone I know who succeeds, their work has become play for them. They have really found a way to enjoy what they do because they found an empowering purpose. Activity without purpose is the drain to your life. It's a drain to fulfillment. It's a drain to achievement. So we're going to get these little simple questions and we're going to show you how to use them in a practical way. This book will guide you to get greater results and greater fulfillment. That's the whole process of what OPA is really about. Part of what OPA is going to do is you're going to put the stakes in the ground and say, these are the most important things in my life and I'm going to focus on them daily. And you're going to start noticing things that will bring you closer to what it is you really want. If you focus on a to-do list, guess what you get? More to-do lists more lack of fulfillment, more things they have to do. I don't want your life to be about being a human doing. I want it to be about a human being where you experience what you really deserve and what you really want. This is a chance to really get fulfilled, to change the emotions. I mean, would you like to feel more joy on a daily basis, more passion, more excitement, a greater sense of confidence and certainty? That comes from knowing that you're in control of the events, not the events are in control of you. I want you to have a system that is your system. Your life management system, that's what OPA really is. So I want to invite you to join me now. Come on this journey. Decide right now you're going to do whatever it takes to master this. Because I can tell you that in my own life, I feel so many great privileges. And I'm sure some of it must be luck. There's luck in anything. But a huge part of it, I can tell you honestly, has been focus. I focused on what I knew was most important in my life. And I've created what I want for my life, which may be different for you. But I want you to have what you want to have not what the environment is demanding from you, not what your next email is requesting, but what your heart and soul deserves and desires. So to do that, let's start with an OPA. To get started, you know the outcome. The outcome's really simple. Right now, you gotta decide, am I committed to mastering a system for managing all my life, so my personal life and my professional life work together, so nothing has to suffer. And I believe it's not only possible, I'm committed to that result. The next question is why. Why are you going to become not just good at this, but outstanding? What's your reason? That's what I'm going to ask you to do right now. And uh, I want to thank you for letting me dump so much on you in this short period of time here. I'm looking forward to hopefully meeting you someday soon. But for right now, let's get focused. And let's get this life management system called OPA in your life now. And begin the journey towards a life of incredible results and extraordinary fulfillment. You know, we're living in a time in which stress seems to be almost epidemic especially for achievers. Everybody talks about being stressed, especially those people who are really trying to do something meaningful, really accomplish something. And I want to make sure that your drive for success or to make a difference really leads to the joy and the fulfillment, and the excitement and the passion and the pride that you're really looking for. In order to do that, whether or not you're feeling fulfilled or whether you're feeling frustrated to a great extent has to do with where do you spend your time? What zone, what dimension of mind, emotion and focus do you spend your time in? For example, do you spend a lot of your time really looking for distraction, looking for a way to escape the stresses that are already there in your life? Or do you spend more of your time getting seduced by things that really aren't important, but they appear to be urgent, and you kind of delude yourself in saying, well, I got to do this right now, when really, truly, you don't have to do it right now, but you add that additional stress? Or do you spend your time in drama? where you're doing things that really are important, and they're really urgent. You got all these deadlines that have to be met right now. Maybe some of the deadlines that are stressing you out now because things weren't handled earlier on. Or have you managed to spend the majority of your time in your life in what I call the zone, the zone of fulfillment, that dimension where you're doing things that are really important but not really urgent. And as a result, you tend to be at your best because you've taken away the stress. Take a look at what I call time targets. Let's start on the outside as this assembles now. 
The outside circle here is really where most people spend their time. It's in escape. In fact, it's doing things that are not urgent and they're not important. I call this the dimension of distraction. Or for short, you can just call it the escape dimension. This is what happens for most people. They have all these goals and desires. They don't know how to manage them all. So they look to escape. How? Drink some alcohol. Go hang out. Go watch television. Do something that for the moment is escape. Now, is that all bad and all wrong? The answer is no. But if you spend the majority of your time there, you won't be fulfilled as a person and your stress will actually increase. Now, the next circle, closer in to the target, is that area that we call the dimension of delusion. That's because this is the area where you start doing things that are urgent. This is where you spend your time, but they're really not that important. And what fits in this category? Emails. I mean, these days, all somebody's going to do is type something and they can send it to 50 people with one keystroke. So a lot of us end up with a lot of emails that don't really, they, they beg us to respond immediately. But would you agree with me? A lot of it is just things that seem important but really aren't important at all, they're just urgent because there's this demand that says, handle me, I'm here on your screen. The more classic example is the telephone. I mean, the phone rings and you're in the middle of something really important and now you run to grab it and break the pattern of your focus and your feelings. Now, if we go to the third ring, the one closest to the bullseye, that's urgent and important items. That's the dimension of demand. That's where something says, we gotta do this right now, you're gonna have to spend time there. And a good portion of your life, if you're an achiever, is spent there. But if you spend too much area, too much time, too much focus, too much emotion in the area called demand, in that dimension, you're going to be one stress character. So you've got to have a certain percentage of your time here, but not more than you need. And life will give you plenty of urgent and important things to deal with without you not doing your part. Where do you want to spend the majority of your time? You want to hit the bullseye as often as possible. That bullseye is the dimension of fulfillment. That's when you're doing things that are really important, but they're not urgent right now. Now, what fits in that category? Your health. Most people wait till they have a health problem to try and deal with it, and very often it's too late. We gotta make that something that even though it's not urgent, we make important and we make that the time we spend no matter what. We spend time in what's important. So one of the secrets here is to identify where do you spend your time. Are you spending 20% of your time in the zone, 60% of your time in urgent and important called the dimension of demand, and then five and 10 or whatever in the other two? Are you spending 50% of your time in the zone? Well, let's do some time accounting of last week. Go for it and let's do it right now. So what did you discover? Where are you spending your time? The optimum time, the goal, is to spend close to 50% of your time doing things that are important but not urgent, at least 40% of the time. If you're in that 10 or 20%, I know you're going to be stressed and you're not going to be as effective as you could possibly be. Does that make sense? People in my company will tell you, I believe that anything we really want to get done if we're committed, there's a way to do it. There's some form of leverage. Someone else could speed it up for us. Someone else we could trade with. We could do something with. We could make it happen. Boy, if you could do that, your life would feel more fulfilled singing, a dance class, walking on the beach, time alone, time with a friend. I don't know what it is, but what is it for you? Maybe write those down. Guess what will bring you to the zone day after day after day? Opa, when you ask that question, what's the most important outcome to me, it'll cause you to focus on what's most important to you, not just what's urgent. But what will bring you there is this life management system and this focus on outcomes. So have I sold you yet? You got to make sure you focus on spending as much time as possible doing what's important and not urgent. Get yourself into that 40, 50, 60 percentile there and you're in for a great time with a lot less stress and an amazing amount of joy. Thank you. I'll bet I know where you want to spend the rest of your life. In the zone, right? Well, for me, this is the zone. What is it for you? Now let's go back to Tony in Fiji, and he's gonna show you, just as he's shown me, how to create the life plan that will place you in the zone. Shall I proceed? Now we're gonna talk about categories of improvement. What we're really talking about is creating a life plan for you now. If you don't have a plan, you fall into somebody else's plan. It's the old thing of, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. It's an old overused phrase, but it's really true. Without a plan, your focus goes to what you fear, something that could give you pain, 
or it goes to something that gave you pleasure for the moment so you can get out of the stress, or it goes to something that someone's demanding for you. We want you right now to begin to create a life plan. In order to have a life plan, you gotta have something you can manage. Think of this as a life management system. If you're gonna manage your life, you gotta look at what are the areas of your life that you really need to manage in order to succeed and be fulfilled. We call these areas, obviously, areas of management. There's only two primary areas of your life you really have to manage. Area one is obviously your personal life. And we're gonna take a look at what are the areas that you need to focus on on a regular basis in your personal life in order for you to not only be fulfilled, but have a life that really works. In your professional life, there are a lot of different things you gotta look at. If you try to think about all of them at once, it's a bit overwhelming. But virtually everything you do in your business life or career can fit into four, five, six, or a dozen categories. Think of it as areas you're gonna focus on. And the reason we call them categories is we don't wanna just focus on them. These are areas that we want to continuously focus on and do things to improve them. Now, if you don't come up with an area and actually define it, life tends to grab your focus. So for example, in your personal life, what would be an area that you would need to continuously focus on and continuously improve if your life's gonna work? Well, one area of your life would have to be your physical vitality and health. If you don't take care of that, if you don't focus on it, does it get better automatically? You and I both know the answer is no. You have to put focus in it, and you also have to measure it. The same thing is true of your finances. Finances don't get better by just hoping. Finances don't get better without focusing on it. If we don't focus on it, our finances tend to stay where they are, get worse. Same thing is true of friendships, relationships. Same thing is true with your family. Same thing is true of your spirituality. If you don't put a focus on what you believe spiritually and making sure you're measuring that you're really aligning yourself with your creator or whatever you believe, then you don't feel that same level of fulfillment in that area of your life. So we're going to put the stakes in the ground and say, you know what, I'm going to have a life plan that's going to require me to continuously measure my progress in each of these areas. And I'm going to set specific goals in each of these areas. And when I go to plan my day, instead of saying, what do I need to do? I'm going to say, what's most important for me to achieve? Because unless you come up with those categories, your focus will go to the urgencies of the moment and you'll be pulled out of the zone and you won't get the results or the fulfillment you deserve. Think of it this way. You cannot manage what you can't measure. So you got to stop and measure it and say, this is what it's going to be and this is how I'm going to achieve it. In fact, and a good metaphor for it is this, the little wheel of life. It's just a simple thing. And let's have you watch us do it and then do it for yourself. Like, for example, in this person's case, we'd say, where is this person in these six areas? Their physical body? Where are they compared to where they want to be? If the dot in the middle here is zero and the edge of the wheel is 100% of where they want to be, where are you? Are you 100%? Are you a 10 physically? Or are you a 5 or a 3 or a 7? As I say, this person says, well, I'm about 70% of what I'd like to be ideally. Okay, well, let's figure out about 70% of the distance and draw a mark right now, just like we've done. Let's look at emotional life for a second. Where are you emotionally compared to where you want to be? Emotion means how much joy, how much passion, how much excitement? It's probably about 30% of where I want it to be. Well, then draw a line of it's approximately 30% like we're doing here. And let's look at the next area. Let's say your financial life. Where is it compared to you want it to be? Well, I have very big goals. I'm about 10% of where I want to be there. Someone else may say, no, I'm 90% of where I want to be. Okay, well, mark that. Let's look at your family life. What's that like? You go, no, that's really good. I'm really happy with that. That's about 80%. Where's your spiritual life? I'd say if I was honest with myself, that's about a 50% of where I really think it needs to be. And lastly, you say, what about your career? And you say, well, my career's doing pretty good. I give that 90%. Connect each one of these sections so they become a continuous outline forming a shape. All right, now look at the shape we've got here. If this was the tire on the car called your life, how would your car drive? Well, for most people, it would be a rough ride. The categories of improvement, having these areas you're not just going to focus on continuously, but you're going to constantly improve have specific goals for and plans for, and that your life revolves around, will not only take you out of overwhelm, but it'll give you the power of balance. Because for most people, they think of balance as a passive thing. Balance gives you this well-roundedness that allows that tire to go stronger and faster and produce greater and greater results while being more and more fulfilled. So we have two areas of management. What are they? They're, of course, our personal life and then our professional life. Let's just take one of them. Let's take your personal life. And let's come up with what are the areas of your personal life you're going to continuously focus on and improve. Do you get the idea? 
Okay, you don't have to do this perfectly, and you can change this. It'll only take you two or three minutes. Go ahead and do this right now. Now, that was pretty easy, wasn't it? I mean, it doesn't have to be perfect, but you'll tend to notice that most people in their personal life have very similar categories because there aren't that many areas of our life that we really need to focus on for our life to be fulfilled and to be successful and for it to be balanced. Our professional lives tend to vary a little bit more because it depends on your profession. So now we're going to make that set of categories. You know, making sure I constantly improve my skills as a manager or as a salesperson or a marketer or as an accountant or as a lawyer or as a doctor. This is an area I've got to constantly improve to be happy, to be fulfilled, to be successful. That's an area I've got to constantly focus on. I can't just improve it once in a while. I've got to think about it and measure my improvement so I continue to have a competitive advantage and so that I feel good about my life. We want to keep that tire of your life round and strong so like a snowball, it not only moves smoothly and rapidly, but it gets bigger and bigger. So let's decide what you're going to focus on in your professional life, what you're going to constantly improve so this part of your life is as fulfilling as your personal life as well. So let's get started. Why don't you go ahead and start right now. So how'd you do? I'm sure not perfectly. I know I was far from perfect making my first list of professional categories, but you can make it better. You're getting a start here. Roles are the places, the way you think about yourself, I guess I should say, as you're working in this area. So, for example, if you go, i got to work on my finances, it's different than you say, you know, I need to work on being my financial genius today. Because when you're feeling a financial genius, it makes you smile. It puts you in a different place. In these areas of your life, these categories of improvement, let's juice them up. Let's say in the area of your physical body, maybe we'll put a word or two there like world-class fitness, and then we want to create two or three roles, or maybe more. Who are you? You're an athlete. You're maybe an Adonis, right? Something humorous, something that'll juice you up, something that'll make you smile, something that'll say, wow, when I think about that, I want to go there. I want to spend time in that particular area of my life. I'm a pilot, for example. Saying I'm a pilot is interesting, but when I go, you know, I'm a licensed source of passion. <laughs> That makes me laugh. That makes me smile. That may allows me to share that feeling with other people in a different way. Let me give you some specific examples of how this could affect you. I had a woman who came to one of my seminars here for more time, and she was really frustrated and really depressed. And she raised her hand and she goes, well, what if you got categories, but you don't want to make any categories because you hate your job? I said, well, you know, let's talk about that for a second. What's your job? She goes, well, I'm a school teacher. And the look on her face made you know that she wasn't too terribly thrilled about it. So I said, well, what do you associate to being a school teacher? What are your roles as a school teacher? Because when you have an idea of who you are, you come up with these beliefs about what you are. She goes, well, I'm a disciplinarian. She goes, I'm, in the, I'm basically the enforcer of the state's will. I'm a babysitter because their parents never took care of these kids, and so I have to constantly discipline and babysit them. And she was rather harsh. I said, ma'am, I understand how you feel, but can I ask you a question? Why did you originally become a school teacher? You obviously wanted to be that at one time. She goes, well, uh, I don't know. I, I thought I could make a difference. I said, what did you really want to be? What did being a school teacher mean to you back then? What was the role of that? And she said, I guess I wanted to be a developer of the human spirit. And you watched her whole face just all of a sudden change. I said, then why don't you just do that? Why don't you be a developer of the human spirit? And she said, well, I said, if you were a developer of the human spirit versus a teacher, what would the rules of the game be? Who would you be? What would you do? She goes, well, if I was a developer of the human spirit, I'd have to love every child in my class. And her whole face changed. She started to smile. I said, if you were developing the human spirit, what else would you have to do? She goes, well, I'd, I'd have to make learning fun. I'd have to get to know the parents and not make them wrong and help them understand their own children and what's happening in their lives. And she went on and on and on. And she just, I said, so how do you feel about your job? She goes, I got a career. <laughs> And it was that second of shift that happens when we change what something means. Words have power. They change our biochemistry. You ever had somebody call you a particular word and felt the change in your body? Words have power. The right words. They change what things mean to us. I'll give you one other quick example. A woman comes to one of our seminars, very frustrated, stressed out, hates her job. What does she do? I'm a stockbroker on Wall Street. Well, what do you do as a stockbroker? Well, you got to go cold call a bunch of people and trying to give them give your money and then. Then you got to follow up all the time, and I just hate it. I said, okay, well, you can change the job, but before you do, you know what the problem with changing jobs is? 
you take you with you. You always think if the company's the problem and you go to a new job, it feels okay for a while, but pretty soon you're back to the same problems. I said, what we got to do is change your mentality, your psychology. I said, did you ever enjoy this? She goes, well, in the beginning, I was kind of excited about it. I said, well, let me ask you a question. What are you really being? What would be a role, a way of describing what you do that would make you grin from ear to ear? What do you really want to be? She goes, well, I want to be a mover and shaker. And I said, well, you're on Wall Street. You work for one of the biggest firms in the world. You're doing quite well. I said, maybe that's what you are. And all of a sudden she smiled and she goes, damn right I am. I said, what else are you? When you're making cold calls, forget that. Who do you want to be when you communicate with people on the phone? And she said, a treasure hunter. <laughs> she said, I want to search for treasure. I want to help people. I want to get them to give me some of their money and go use it to find treasure for them and help them expand their treasure. And she just, her entire psychology changed. So what I want you right now is I want you to take each of these categories you have, both in your personal life and professional life, and I want you to juice them up. Maybe make the name of the area a little bit more juicy, but most importantly, come up with two or three roles that make it fun to be there. Little things make a big difference. Let me tell you what Oprah's gonna do for you. Well, most of the stuff you know, but maybe you have your own words for it, or maybe at times you do this and other times you don't, all I'm doing is giving you a set of words, a system, that you probably already do at times, but by knowing what it is, you can do it consistently and not hope some of the time you feel good and sometimes you don't. If you're heading in this direction right here and we make a little 10 degree shift with OPA, that seems like nothing. But we take that out a week from now, a month from now, six months from now, you're in a totally different destination in your life. Radically different difference. And language and identity are a big part of that. But start this process right now of juicing up your life by figuring out what are the roles you're going to play in these areas that are so important in your life called categories improvement. Let's do it right now. So we've got to ask those questions. So now the big question is, how do we turn this into a system? Well, a big part of the system of being able to manage something, besides knowing the outcome, knowing why, and the action item, is creating a visual chunking system. Now, what the heck does that mean, a visual chunking system? Well, let me give you an example. When we are given tons of information really quickly, and we get this little bit of information, this and this and this and this and this and this and this, and this, and this pretty soon a human being gets un overwhelmed. But if we find a way to connect various things through a period of time, we can find a shape and pretty soon all of these items might become three things. I'm gonna get the idea of what I mean by this. So instead of all these individual items making you crazy, Chunking is grouping together individual items, resources, ideas, or thoughts so that by grouping them together, they become more useful. And part of what makes them more useful is by collecting them together, you're able to focus on them and not become overwhelmed. How many follow that thought? Say, aye. So I'll give you an example, and let's test your chunking ability real fast. I'm going to show you a series of letters, and what I'd like you to do when I show you those letters is I want you to immediately chunk those letters. What I mean is I'm going to show it to you very briefly and the camera should only look straight on here when I go to show you and I want you to write them down what you remember. I'm going to give you a very brief time to look at it. Okay. You look it up on the screen will probably be the easiest way. Here we go. Okay. Write it down. Raise your hand if you're finished. Raise your hand if you're finished. Okay, great. So I'll turn around now and then see how accurate you were. How many got them all accurately in order? Let me see a show of hands. Okay, keep your hands up. So we got less than 5% of the room, probably 3% of the room. How many got, well, how many letters are there? I think there's 11. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. How many got, uh, of the 11 letters, you got at least 7 or more of them accurately? Okay. How many got less than five accurately? How many got less than, oh, less than five? Okay, good. So what if I said to you, now how did you 
try to figure this out. How did you try to remember this? Somebody, somebody succeeded and did it. Sir, did you get them all? Okay, tell me how, he, now what I want to see is how he chunked it. Now what does chunking mean? He didn't try to get the whole thing at once. He grouped it in some way, I'd be willing to bet. That's why he was able to retain it. So how did you chunk this? Um, e U B Q E L and then E U B Q E L Q E L and then Q R A W or U U. Okay. So he chunked he chunked it into three chunks. Okay, and that helped him to remember it. Okay, give me a hand. Nice job. Yes. Tony, I didn't write them down. I just flashed on it, and I know what the word is. You know what the word was? Yeah. Okay. What's the word? Albuquerque. That's correct. What if I wrote it this way? How many of you would have been able to write it down? Can you see it? How many of you have wrote it out that way? You would have been able to write it down immediately. Let me see a show of hands. Sure, because you recognize Albuquerque. Because Albuquerque is one chunk for most of you. But it was all these things that were random. Most of you weren't able to get it. Many of you tried and failed. Let's see why you did. Now, are you from Albuquerque? Do you know anybody in Albuquerque? I'm, uh, I live about 100 miles from there. Why would he be able to see that when it has not, looks nothing like Albuquerque? Because when something becomes part of your focus, like when you buy a certain car or you buy a certain outfit, and all of a sudden you see that car outfit everywhere, well, once you do that, all that information was always around you, but it's become important. So part of your brain sees anything that would relate to it. That's also what happens when you have a clear outcome. When you have a clear outcome, suddenly you start seeing Albuquerque where other people see nothing but a mixture of stuff. You start seeing with your outcome how to achieve it where no one else can figure it out because you have a clear outcome. I did this once in a seminar a couple of years ago, and the lady said, I know it is, it's Albuquerque. And I said, do you live near Albuquerque? She said, no. Ever live near? She said, no. I said, you have a lover in Albuquerque, don't you? And she went, no, I don't. And everybody saw her face. She was in school and she started laughing. She goes, well, I do have a lover. How do you know I had a lover? Because I know the person either had a proximity or something they had an emotional association to to unscramble something with no help. In a matter of, I gave it to you for five seconds. When you became emotionally associated to something or you have clarity of something being important, your brain figures the whole thing out. That's what the value of outcomes are. Is that pretty powerful? Now, how many could have gotten it here? Come on, how many could have got Albuquerque here? If I did this way, you could have written down the letters and say, I, because it would be chunk differently. So who else got it, though, this way? That's more than one. Yes, how did you chunk it? I made it you could crow. E-U. B. B. You could crow. Kel. Crow. Crap. So she chunked it how many times? Three times, and she chunked it auditorily instead of visually. How many see that? By the way, do you see a pattern? Both these people that succeeded chunked it three times. Somebody else. I, I sort of started off by just doing what this dude did, back there did, which is just sort of like one at a time. I sort of put E-U, B-Q, E-L, and then just the grouse sort of seemed to work, so I probably just threw that down. So you still chunked two, yeah, and then you went three, to the last two, one. And then so she still did. Th chunking in threes is most common. For most people, someone shared this with me the other day, chunking, they chunk like this. One, two, three, many. <laughs> When you get beyond three, for most people, it's many. So three is usually, and if you try to chunk it as one, unless you have the reference for Albuquerque, you are in bad shape. Who did not get it? Who did terribly, honestly? Because you did terribly, there's nothing wrong with you. It's just that your strategy for chunking was not effective. So, sir, how did you try to chunk it? I tried to chunk it E-U-B-Q-E-L, except... All e this is one? No, I tried to do it in three, but the, in my language rules, U always follows Q. <laughs> And so I, I got all confused about halfway through it. So. Okay, so what happened is he tried to chunk it with three, but he let his belief systems, he calls his rules, determine that this couldn't be. And that fried his brain. So what you have to understand is if you're going to get a job done, if you're going to take a dream and turn it to reality, you're going to have to chunk it into a bite size, not so small you're overwhelmed and can't remember it, and not so big that you're overwhelmed. And so what OPA is is a visual chunking system. I'll give you one more. Let's see what you've learned. I'll give you one more example real quick here. Are you ready? This one's easy. Ready? Put your pens down. I want you to remember this in your head. This is a chunking thing. Here we go. How many got it? Let me see your hands. Okay, how many did not get it? Okay. Those who got it, raise your hand and tell me how you chunked it. Yes, ma'am. I read it out loud to myself. I said that says Tura Perini. Tura Perini. Three syllables, three chunks. 
She used auditory, three chunks. Give her a hand. Nice job. Oh, come on. Give her a real hand. Who else got it? Yes, ma'am. How'd you do it? Um, I'm a linguist, so I tend to look for the word that I know in any of the languages that I've studied. In this case, um, T-E-R-R-U is like earth. Oh, that's interesting. And I, I kept it in my mind. <laughs> earth. And the Pyrenees in France. So I kept the mountain. So the point is the ideal chunking system is three if you have no reference. If you have a reference for something, you can chunk it in a larger chunk. For example, driving your car, your stick shift now, is one chunk for most of you. In the beginning, it would have been useful if you could have said, okay, there's the things I do with my feet, there's the things I do with my eyes, and things I do with my hands. But what happens for most people is they go, oh, what am I going to do? I've got to put this, and I'm going to do this, and this, and they have no chunking system in the very beginning, and so they're overwhelmed. But very quickly, unconsciously, your brain begins to chunk three things, and eventually, when you're familiar enough, it becomes one thing. It's like it all come together in your head and you'll be able to do things no one else can do. How many follow? So what I did with the human brain is chunk the entire psychology of what makes a human being do what they do. So that's what you can now do with your life as well through this process.